Praise the Lord. So happy to see each of you today as we continue our lesson 10, part two, which is victory. Uh, we're on page two, and actually I'm just going to uh, do a brief overview uh, from question four. Who has already won this fight? If we're talking about victory, there is a spiritual warfare going on, right? Between the flesh and the spirit. And who has already won this fight? In question four, we learned it was Jesus. Be of good cheer. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. And in verse, question five, rather, what effective weapon did Jesus use in the time of his temptation? He always used the words of the Bible. It is written. And uh, knowing it's a spiritual battle, we need to know God's word and apply God's word in our life. It's not enough just to know it and quote it. It must be applied in our life. Then when we use it against the enemy, it is an effective weapon. Then we stopped with six. We actually did six, but we're going to read um, Hebrews 2.14 and 2.15 because six, question six, by his death, what enemy did Christ overcome will be answered in Hebrews 2.14, even though we've already done it. But in between, we had all these different verses. So here we're going to do it and then go right into verse 7. Who was delivered by this victory? Hebrews 2.15. And we will see it more in context. So if our sister Toyin would read to us uh, Hebrews 2.14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. All right, so we found out in verse 14 that he um, defeated the enemy, the devil, all right? And the enemy used to have the power of death, all right? But uh, Jesus took it away from him in the resurrection, all right? So Jesus defeated Satan, the enemy, all right? And who was delivered, that's question number seven, which we're going to study today. Who was delivered by this victory? It said there in Hebrews 2, 15, those who were all their lifetime subject to bondage, all right? He delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage, all right? So this explains who was delivered, but it explains how we ended up in bondage, all right, through fear of death. Now, I don't want you to think it's merely death when it finally comes. Of course, that is the ultimate uh, dying, but most of us would say, I'm not afraid to die because we've never really faced it yet per se. Maybe some of us have. We've had very close encounters and we have faced it. But I, I want you to know, and as I put there under number A, seven, all right, uh, one A, all right, death to self, death to self. Because when we accept the Lord, we become a brand new creature and we are to account that old nature to be dead. But there is within all of us that fear of dying out to the self-life, all right, uh, in that it will 
how will it affect our image? How will it, will it affect our reputation? How will it affect our body? How will it affect our rights? How will it affect our desires? We're faced with these um, decisions that we have to make regularly in our life when we face different situations that arise. How, how is that gonna make me look? What will people think of me? What will happen if this happens to my body or that happens to my body, all right? When, when our rights are taken away, we get so upset, but I have a right to it. I paid money on that. You cannot just push me to one side and, and we begin to fight for our rights and for our desires. So this is what the fear of death is. If we cannot overcome those when it comes time to die, I will tell you, friends, we will face it full of fear. And if we face it full of fear, because fear is the opposite of faith, we're not going to make it on the other side. So we have to learn to deny the self now in our daily walk and our daily experiential life. Then when it comes time for actually going out, we will have our eyes so on the Lord because that's the way, that's the only way we're going to make it through in each situation, all right, is by keeping our eyes on the Lord. So uh, our number two of question seven is deliver them how. Uh, let's read Second Timothy chapter one, verse 10. Second Timothy one, verse 10. <clears throat> it says, but this, but, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. All right. So we see it's through the gospel. It's through the good news of Jesus. Because when Jesus died on the cross and arose from the dead, uh, the church really was not yet formed. All right. And people uh, only believed in God. They didn't, they knew about the Messiah, but they didn't know who the Messiah was. So it was like, faith in whatever God had told them in the Old Testament, all right? But now that he has done the work, and now the good news, that's what the gospel is all about, the good news of Jesus, uh, tells us that we can be a new creature in Christ, and we don't really have to worry about what happens to the old, because now we are in him, we keep our eyes on him. All right, let's look at that. Uh, Romans 1.16. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Yeah, Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ, because that has the power of God that will bring deliverance in any situation, all right, to the person that believeth, continues to believe, not just a one-time believing, but believing moment by moment, step by step, all right, in the face of any and every situation that arises, all right, You'll notice it says to the Jew first and then to the Greek, because Jesus came first to the Jews. They had to reject him. Then only could he really turn. And when they rejected him, the leaders and the, the mass majority, of course, there were the few that loved him. But the 
vast majority as a nation. They rejected him when they had him go to the cross and die and chose, you know, Barabbas, a thief and a murderer instead of Jesus. All right. They didn't want Jesus, but it was all out of jealousy, if you remember right. All right. But this Romans 1.16 tells us we're not to be ashamed. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. The good news of Jesus is actually the power of God released into any life, into any situation, the moment it is truly believed on. All right. So it's very important that we start applying what we learn and start believing who we really are. You will be surprised how many of us uh, are believers in Jesus, yet we still see ourselves after the natural. Instead of seeing ourselves the way God says who we are. When we start believing what the Bible tells us who we are in Christ, then as we face natural situations, immediately we're going to go back to the word that tells us about Jesus and the belief in Jesus that he is so powerful, he can take care of our situation, whatever it is at that very moment. If we only see ourselves in the natural and we only think of ourselves you know, in the spiritual when we go to church or see ourselves in the spiritual when we die, we get to go to heaven. No, we're not going to have victory here in this life. It tells us very clearly, all right, that it is through the good news of Jesus and it is the very power of God to those, all right, that believe in that situation. I don't know which class, it was quite recent that I told the story, but I'm going to tell it again. And that is when I was a teenager and living and I'd come back, we, our family came back from China out of the uh, communist, sorry, the Japanese concentration camp, all right. And um, we were living in Omak, Washington, in a house that my uncle provided for us if we would take care of grandpa and my aunt Elta. So um, they, they were living in the same house as us. And um, my aunt who, my mother is number three, my aunt was number one, actually their family. This has nothing to do with our lesson, but it's just interesting. There were, I think 11 of them that were, had stayed alive, but there were all together more than 11. And they came out, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, right down to the end when there were twins and the twins came out in this right order of, you know, whether it was a boy first and then a girl, whatever order that made that girl boy right down to the end. How that happened, I have no way to know. But this was my aunt, um, who was my mother's older sister. She had married a doctor, Dr. Piro, and they lived in Chelan, Washington, which was above us. We lived in Omak. And if we wanted to go to the place, you would catch the planes. That was Wenatchee, all right? Um, in, they lived there in Chelan, and my, my aunt said to my mother, you know, um, why don't you let Margaret come to my home for the summer, during the summer holidays, and I will teach her how to be a housekeeper. I will teach her how to wash dishes, how to clean floors, make beds, this, that, the other. Because, you know, in China, we had had servants, so really... I didn't learn all of those different things and she felt I needed to know it. And to my dismay, my mother said, okay. So I was sent to her for the summer. Well, she had 
two houses, Summer House, uh, which was on Lake Chelan. It was a beautiful log cabin house, two story. And then she, uh, there was the winter home where her husband, they used it partially also as his offices for, uh, he was a doctor, all right. And then there was her son who was married. So there were three houses and she used me to learn these lessons by every week we had to clean these three houses and wash dishes and so forth and so on. Anyways, we, I would work all morning until after lunch, once the lunch dishes were done, she said, you're free. And we were staying at the summer home, which was next to Lake Chelan. And, and she said, in the afternoon, you make friends with some of the girls that are your age. And you have every afternoon off. You can go swimming, hiking, doing whatever you want with your friends. But you have to be home by a certain time. And then you have to do the night chores before you go to bed. Well, you know, all this time, now I'm saved. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. but I never witnessed to my friends. I didn't know if they were born again, if they were not born again. I just had never witnessed to them, to tell them about Jesus. And um, this says, don't be ashamed. You see, if we're not ashamed, sometimes we don't witness because don't know what they will think of me if I tell them about Jesus. Don't know if they'll want to be my friend anymore. See, the self is there. We, we don't consciously think like that. But otherwise, when we're full of Jesus and full of the love for Jesus and really focusing on him and understanding it all, you know, we want everybody to hear. And everybody we come across, whether they want to hear it or not, we just feel like we need to let them know about Jesus, all right? But I didn't see. So this one afternoon, we were together, three of us. All of us knew how to swim. And this first girl suggested, she said, do you see that raft out there in the middle of Lake Chelan? And by the way, Lake Chelan was a beautiful lake, crystal clear. You could look right down. You could see everything in that water. You could see the rocks, plants, anything that was down there. It was crystal clear. And she said, do you see that raft out there? Okay, let's say one, two, three, and we'll all dive in um, the lake and see who can make it to that raft first. All right, so one, two, three, and the three of us dove into Lake Chelan and we were swimming as fast as we could. The one who suggested it, she arrived there first and of course climbed up on the raft and she was the winner, but there were still two of us. And so we were swimming, 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 and I made it there second. And I got up on the raft. Now we're waiting for our third partner to arrive. And she wasn't too far from the raft when she started screaming and she went down in the water and she came up and yelling and screaming, save me, save me. Something was wrong. I don't know what had happened to her. But this first girl said, oh my, I've got to go to to the shore, not where we were, but to where there was a jetty coming out. I'll swim there and get help. And she dove in and she took off with this girl drowning in front of my eyes. I had never saved a person in my life. She took off. It looked like she meant well, but actually she deserted us because she could have tried to help but she didn't stay, she left. And I, I didn't know what to do. So I, you can't just stand there and watch people die. At least I couldn't. And so I 
uh, jumped into the water. And the moment I got near to her to help her, she grabbed me and pushed me under. Now, I didn't realize that's what people uh, that are drowning do. I had never heard of that before. The only time I ever swam was when my father taught me how to swim and it was usually with family. And, you know, it just never dawned on me that that's what they do. When I got away from her and up, I came near her again and again, she pushed me down in to hang on to me. She pushed me down. You, you know what? I suddenly forgot about whether I should tell them about Jesus. I just knew I need Jesus. And I opened my mouth and I shouted, Lord, help me. Oh, help me. I don't know what to do. Please save me. Help me. You know, and I just let it be known that I served a God and I needed him at that time more than anything else. I was not worried at all what she thought about me in my time of need. And, you know, when I called out to the Lord, it was not one minute earlier. It's when I called out to the Lord, he told me what to do. He said, you get on your back and you do a backstroke and you get her and keep her at arm's length. All right. I guess the couple of times that she pushed me under, it, it gave her. Uh, enough air and everything that, you know, she never went down for that last time. I managed, I was an arm's length away from her and I got her by the back of her. You, you didn't wear split bathing suits. You wore, you know, full on ones. A and I got her by the straps and held her out there just crying out, God help me, God help me. And with a backstroke, I pulled her after me all the way to that jetty where that girl had gone. Now, you know, it, it really doesn't have part of this, but it's part of the story. And the girl got there. And by the time they saw us coming in, this she had gotten a hold of this one man. He was a lumberjack. He had big boots on and, you know, and when they saw us, he jumped into the water. He almost drowned because of the heavy clothes and uh, shoe boots that he had on him. But the girl got there safe and sound. And I was never ashamed after that. After that, I let it be known I was a child of God. So, you know, it, it says, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ because when we turn to Christ, when we really believe in him, when we call on that name, it releases the power of God into our situation. Friends, and it's not just you and me that need to know that. Everybody needs to know it. Whether they believe it, whether they accept it or not, they need to have the opportunity to believe it, to help them in life. Some people I have known that, you know, you tell them they don't want, they don't accept, and you tell them, you know, if ever you have a need. And, and that reminds me of a, another story, which I'm going to bring in here. Um, this happened in India, and this man actually was a, like a medium. They consider, they look to him almost like a god, because he had the gift of um, fortune telling and so forth. Um, of course, we know that that is witchcraft and it comes from the wrong source. But when the father died, because he died and he wasn't that old, he had a young son, maybe five years old. And that spirit that was in the father that gave him that power to be able to tell fortunes and uh, so forth, um, transferred because demons don't want to stay in a dead body. They want a living body. So they came out of 
the father and they went into the son and suddenly people began to notice this little boy had the same power that his father had had. And so they began to worship him and come to him for their needs and so forth. So he was very spoiled because everybody oohed and awed over him. He was given money, he was given gifts and all that. He was very spoiled, but he had some cousins, girl cousins who were believers in Jesus. And whenever they came, to visit, they would witness to him about Jesus. Of course, he didn't want anything to do with it. In um, Hinduism, you know, they have thousands of gods. And he was one of those, you know, and why should he want anything to do with Jesus? But I remember the story uh, because I read this. It, it was written in a book form. And uh, they said to him, if ever you have a need that you can't solve or that, you know, calling on your these different gods can't seem to solve, just remember Jesus. You call on the name of Jesus and, and you will find. All right. So this young man now has become like a teenager and he was out on a mountaintop and he went close to the cliff there was this deep cliff and he went there to view the view from this uh cliff and he heard behind him a noise that was quite uh, he knew that noise it was the noise of a snake and he swung around and there was this snake not too far from him coiled up and with his head ready to strike. There was no way he could run this way or that way. And of course, if he went the other way, he would just go right off the cliff. And the strange thing is this, with all the years that he had been, you know, like a God himself and also worshiping these other different Hindu gods, he never called on anyone, but he called on the name of Jesus. He called out, he said, Jesus, if you are real, if you are alive, like my cousin said, help me right now, and I will give my life to you, and I will serve you for the rest of my life. And in his book, he said, that snake uncoiled, turned and left. And he just gave his life to the Lord. And that the rest of the book was all about how he served the Lord and began to preach the good news of Jesus. So people don't always receive it, but the good news of Jesus the power of God is released through that good news when we turn and believe and cry out to Christ, all right? God will then release that power that brings salvation. Let's look at C, Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to claim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Okay, now this is, of course, a prophecy about Jesus. It was written um, 700 years, I believe, before Jesus ever came, but it was pointing down to the time when the Messiah would be born here on earth and then have the spirit of God come upon him. And Jesus quotes this. And he even says, when he quotes it in the book of Luke, this day, this uh, scripture is fulfilled. All right. So 
And that has been given to you and me who have believed in Jesus. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is why God wants to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. All right. Because he wants to anoint us to preach good tidings. All right. To the meek, those who uh, aren't fighting it, but they will receive it. All right. He has sent me not only to preach the good news, but to bind up the brokenhearted. All right. That, that means, friends, uh, pe you know, that we have hospitals for mental. We have hospitals for broken bodies. We have hospitals um, for many things. All right. The church is like a hospital for the spiritual realm. Isn't that right? But those that are brokenhearted, you don't really have hospitals for the emotionally afflicted. All right. Uh, that people don't fully understand it. But here it says God sent Jesus to bind up the brokenhearted so that their broken hearts can be mended and, you know, get back the way that God wants them to be, to not only tell good tidings, but to proclaim, again, through the mouth, liberty to the captives. That means that people that are bound by sins, bound by habits, bound by sickness, uh, all right, no hope ahead, that there is liberty to them. They don't have to be captives anymore. They can be set free and to proclaim the opening of the prison. Those that are bound, they're like in a prison house. No one really understands them, all right? But that they can be totally free, all right? So Jesus, the anointed one to preach, to heal, to deliver, all right, through his resurrection power and life. I want you to put another verse there by that, uh, to deliver, all right, before we get to D. That's John 1, 4. This is part of the good news of Jesus that were to preach, all right? Not just preach, there was a man 2,000 years ago, he died for you, but to preach the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, that he didn't stay dead, that he, he is alive, all right? What does Jesus say here in John 1, 4? Or this is John, um, John the apostle that wrote this book, and he's pointing to Jesus. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Yeah, in him was life, all right? So he not only it came down to this earth to die for us, but he arose from the dead that he might give us spiritual life, that he might give us resurrection, life, and power, that we might become a spiritual entity, all right? Now, let's go to that D, Revelation 1, 8. So remember, in him was life, and this is resurrection, power, and life is in Jesus, and he is still very much alive. In Revelation 1.18, uh, Jesus proclaims, all right, about himself. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Yeah. Now, it, it told us earlier, remember, that he had, um, by his death, he overcame the devil who had the power of death, but the devil doesn't have it anymore because through dying to self, not being afraid by obeying the Lord all the way to death, that's why God resurrected him. And in his resurrection, 
before he came out of the grave, he defeated the enemy and took from him the keys of death and of hell. All right. And um, pray, praise the Lord. So Jesus proclaims there, I am he. All right. I have resurrection life. I am ever living. I am alive forevermore. I, I am he that liveth. I, I'm not a dead Christ. I was dead. Yes, I did die. Yes, that was not just a story. That was not just gossip. It was real. I really died, but I arose from the dead and I'm never going to die again. I'm alive forevermore and I have conquered the devil. I have conquered death. I have conquered hell and I have the keys. I can open and shut. All right. So he says, I am full of power and authority. All right. So uh, when we are delivered, we who were all our lifetime subject to bondage, when we hear that good news and we accept it, and we start believing in it and continue to believe in it every step of the way. So no matter what happens to us, let our eyes turn back to the one who has the answer. We're in him, all right? He's in us and he is still all powerful, full of power and authority. All right, now, question number eight, all right? In order to share in his victory, what consecration must I make? All right. It's not just knowing about it, head knowledge. All right. It's good to know it because if you don't know about it, you're never going to turn to him. But it's more than just knowing about it. If we're really going to share in his victory, we have to do more than just know that he won the victory for us. There's a part we have to play. Let's read that. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore. I think we'll read one first and let me talk and then we'll read two. Okay. Sorry. No problem. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. Now you see, by the mercies of God, in other words, every one of us that come to Jesus have experienced the mercy of God. I've told you before, the grace of God is actually the power of God. It's his life, his ability, his knowledge. It's whatever pertains to God. You and I do not deserve it. Jesus is full of the grace of God. We don't deserve it, but when we cry out to him. But as sinners, we needed more than just the grace of God. We needed the mercy of God because as sinners, we deserve to die. We, the just and right thing to happen to us, we don't deserve to have grace. We deserve to die. And Jesus is the mercy of God, which is in spite of the fact that we deserve to die in loving kindness he gave us what we didn't deserve because of what Jesus did for us. Now, in light of having received the mercy of God, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you ought to present your bodies. If you did this for me to save me, you you died, you suffered, you took my punishment. You literally went down into hell. You defeated the enemy. You came up, you arose from the grave. Then who am I to say thank you, but I'm gonna go on just as I always was and I belong to myself. No, you paid 
that price for me. I'm going to give myself to you willingly, not because you forced me to, but out of my own recognition of everything you've done for me, I willingly, I present my body to you. A living, don't wait till you die. You know, when I was a teenager, I would always say, you know, when I die, I, I'm going to have the victory. When I die, I'm going to be like, no, no, no. He wants us to be like that now. He wants a living sacrifice. He doesn't want your dead body. He wants your body now that is alive, that he has changed, that he has transformed. He wants to use our body to shine through us, to walk in us, uh, to minister to people, all right, a living sacrifice. But notice he doesn't just want your body any old how, holy. He made you holy. Keep it holy. That's really what he's saying here. A living sacrifice, holy. That means set apart for holiness, cleanness, all right, to be like God. That is acceptable to God. And that is your reasonable service. That's not asking too much, seeing what he did for us. He didn't do for us something just you know, for this life, for a few months, a few years here on this life. He did a work of eternal life. He has delivered us from death and the eternal damnation that's waiting for us for eternity to show us his love and his wonders and so forth. So it says it's just a reasonable thing to turn around and give yourself. He'll never take it from you. He'll never demand it of you. He'll never force it of you. We are to present ourselves, our bodies, not just our inner man, but our bodies, all right? Now read verse two, will you? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may approve what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's telling us here, don't be conformed. That means poured into the mold of this world. Remember the verses we had earlier. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. The world's ways, the world's outlook, the world's desires, the things that lure it don't have anything to do with it because if you do you're not you don't have the love of God the love of God is totally different so he says here once you present your body to me all right then you need to be transformed completely changed you know whenever I use that word transform I think of the butterfly or moth, but butterflies are more beautiful than moths. They come from caterpillars. Their first life is like a worm that crawls on this earth and eats the green things on this earth. It can crawl up in a tree. It can, but it, it's just, it, it's earth bound, ugly, ooh. But once it goes into the cocoon, it dies to itself. And when it comes out of that cocoon, there's been a transformation. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't act the same, uh, nothing. It doesn't eat the same food. It's totally different. Its sphere is no longer, it's not earth bound like the caterpillar. It has wings and it flies and soars into the heavenlies and it eats nectar out of flowers, the sweet honey out of flowers instead of eating the other things. So it says, you can be transformed from an earthbound person, all right, 
don't be poured into the mold of this world, but totally transform by letting your mind be renewed, letting your thoughts be changed by God's spirit to thinking and believing differently than you used to. As a man thinketh, so is he. That's what the Bible says. So as our thinking begins to change, to be like the thinking of Jesus and the thinking of God, our lives begin to change. Our habits begin to change. Our ways begin to change. It says in order that you may prove, your, your life will become a proof of what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We will start becoming more and more like Jesus as we begin to allow God's word through his spirit to change our thinking about things. I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again. When I was a teenager, My mother, of course, taught us to read the Bible. She not only read it to us, she taught us to have our own devotions as well. But I never did tell her or anyone else, but I know when I would read the Bible and, and I would see something and it would say it and I'd think, well, I'm not like that. Well, that's not me. <laughs> Instead of hey, if it's not me, then I need to be like that if it's something good or if it's talking about the bad that God doesn't like it. And if that's what's in me, I need to say, Lord, I don't want this in me anymore. I was judging the Bible by my life. But we're to let the Bible judge our life and show us what God is like and through the power of Jesus who is in us, he can change us. He can transform us to become like him. Now, let's go there to um, number eight. We're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. All right, we read that. Let's look at Hebrews 10, verse 5 to 7. Jesus understood what we are given a body for. Too many people think we have a body. It's my body. I can do whatever I want with it. Uh, no, no. That's the way you think before you come to Jesus. But once you come to Jesus, you need to learn through the word why he gave us a body. So let's look at Jesus for uh, the example. Hebrews 10, starting from verse five. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Yeah. Jesus understood it first. We don't understand it because we had sin in our life, which blinded us. But Jesus had no sin. So when he read this in the Old Testament, when he cometh into the world and he understood this was talking about him all right he understood the god that he came to obey and came to serve all right was not a blood thirsty god the religions of this world and i know one of the hindu gods they picture him he has big long fangs coming out of his mouth he has a body in one hand. He has the head of the person in the other hand. And it shows he is 
taken a big bite and the blood is dripping out of his mouth. That was the picture of one of the Hindu gods. I don't know right now if maybe that's Kali, all right, uh, the, the god who likes to kill, all right. But Jesus understood you're not wanting sacrifices and offerings. You're not wanting burnt offerings. You're not wanting just to see a bunch of animals die here, die there uh, to appease your bloodthirstiness. No, that isn't what you find pleasing. You desire to have human bodies to live in, to express your will, to do your will, to live out a living testimony of what pleases God and let others see what pleases God. So Jesus said, lo, I come to do thy will. I didn't come to please myself. I didn't come to make myself happy. I didn't come to experience new experiences. I came to obey you, God. And this should be why we accept him as we follow him to recognize the reason he has given us a new life is to do his will, not to please ourselves. Let's read that last verse uh, on page two before we uh, close. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. All right. So uh, this is telling us how we overcome the devil. All right. The first is by accepting and crying out for the blood of Jesus that was shed to wash away our sins. And we use that blood constantly staying under the blood. And you, it becomes a weapon to us, too. We can use the blood against the devil. You don't hear that much anymore. But when I was young, it was that we plead the blood against you, Satan. We bring the blood against you in the name of Jesus. Yeah, the blood is powerful. It's still living. All right. We stay under it. But another way is by the word of their testimony, when God does something for us, we dare to tell it. We dare to speak it out. We give glory to him and testify by our word. So we, we hear of these two all the time. But that third one so often is left untouched and many times not even preached about. And they love not their lives unto the death. All right. Don't try to save yourself. Don't try to enrich yourself. Don't try to, you know, don't be afraid of dying in any of those ways we mentioned, all right? Um, don't just worry about dying at the end. We have to learn to don't love your life now. And if anything We've got to recognize what is self and judge that self because it's not us anymore. It's no longer I that liveth. It's Christ in me. All right. It isn't something that makes me look good. It's not something that pleases me. It's not something that will protect me. Me cannot be uh, the, the center and the root uh, reason why we do anything. It all has to be him, him, him. And we have to be willing to die to self in this life. And even if it means dying and giving our life, you know, uh, where we won't deny him, they're going to take our physical life. We're willing to die physically for him. All right love their, not their lives, unto the death. Okay, I think um, this is a good time for us to stop. When we come back, 
we will uh, start with question number nine. So it's now 9.57. We will, somebody tell when we're coming back, 10 minutes time. Just 10.10, 10, it's okay, right? 10.10 okay. 10 or, yeah? That's okay, as long as, I, because I'm gonna finish page okay. three. But um, okay. there aren't that many verses, so I think we can do it. Okay. okay. All right. 10.10. 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're on page three, lesson 10, part two, all right? Whose strength, number nine at the top of the page, whose strength is mine to use? Uh, whose strength, whose ability, whose life is mine to use? The answer, all right, is found in Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Would you read that for us? Philippians 4, starting from verse 11. Read um, what the answer is there, all right? Okay. I can do. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Yeah, but now we're going to start from the beginning where that's taken from. Okay. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Yeah. Now, uh, the answer, of course, is I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It's through Christ. We cannot do it on our own. We have to know if we are new creatures in Christ. We're new creations. We're still in ourself, no power. Our power, our strength comes in Christ and through him. All right, through him. So whose strength is mine to use? The Lord's strength, the strength of Jesus as I turn to him. All right. Now, through this in uh, Philippians 4, 11 to 13, he teaches us about contentment. And I think this is very, very important for us to learn because there are some people that teach, you know, if you're right with God, if you're doing everything right then you, you will be wealthy. All right. No, 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 no. You will never lack. No, don't say that. Paul here is saying, I'm not speaking in respect of want. Uh, actually, probably we would have needed to read a few verses beforehand when he was talking, because he says, I've learned in whatever state I am, to be content. Whatever happens, there are times we have an abundance. There are times we don't have an abundance. And the Lord is wanting us to be happy, contented, no matter which way it goes, that we are, and he will lead us through circumstances one way and the other way, so that it's not only that when I'm have everything, I'm rich, I have a, a big bank account, then only I can be happy. No, what if something happens and you don't have anything in the bank? Can you still rejoice, see? So he says in whatever state to be content in adverse circumstances, when adverse circumstances come, can I still be content, all right? And then he goes on to, uh, and notice that in verse 11, I have learned. It didn't just automatically come to me when I became a Christian. Through my circumstances of life, I've had to learn these things. And so God will take us through different situations, all right? in order for us to learn. Now, verse 12, 
and I know both how to be abased. Abased is to be put down. I put there humbled, humiliated, brought low, abased, all right? Uh, It's easy when he puts us up. None of us mind that, to be lifted up, to get everything, to be rich, to be wealthy, to be recognized, all that. that. That's easy to take, except that it opens the door for pride many times. But he says, I've learned how to be abased. I've learned how to be put down lower, whether it's in treatment, whether it's in circumstances, whether it's in what, whatever. All right, I've learned how to be abased and I know how to abound. To know how to abound means no matter how he blesses you, you don't allow pride to come in, arrogance to come in, haughtiness to come in. Uh, You know, oh, sometimes um, you can say God can't trust us to be wealthy. When we have nothing, it's easier to trust him. But once you've tasted of the, you know, the better way, the better things of life to go down to be a base is very difficult. But we need to know whichever way it isn't what we have and what we are and how people treat us really that matters. What really matters is Are we learning to know God? Are we behaving like God wants us to? Are we glorifying God? So it says, I am in in all things. That means every circumstance of life. I am instructed both to be full. That means in the midst of plenty and to be hungry. All right. So I can be full where I lack nothing, but if I'm in a place where I don't have and I'm hungry, then I have to learn how to take that as well. And and I know the Lord has uh, brought my family. I I know the time when there was nothing, all right, in the fridge. There was no food. There was no money to get food. And I remember my husband driving us to the post office and putting his hand in that post box, all right, thinking, Lord, surely you're gonna send us some money. And all he came out with was the dust from that post box. There was nothing in it. And we went home as empty handed as we left home. Now, are we gonna get mad at God? Are we gonna, you know? And I remember just praying out loud and saying, Lord, Fred and I can fast. If we need to fast, we can fast. But what am I going to tell my three little children that you couldn't provide for us? There's no food for them. How do you teach little children to fast? They won't understand that when we've been telling them you provide everything. I I asked God that. But you know what? That was the time when we got home and walked in. There was a full meal, curry meal, rice, everything, all on our kitchen table. Whoa, we didn't even ask questions. We just dived in and enjoyed the meal, even though we had nothing ourselves to make food with, only to find out later it was the Hindu neighbors and this, the oldest daughter came and asked me, because we didn't know who had left the food there. Did, did you find, I said, yeah, I hope you don't want it back because it's, oh, we ate it. We didn't have anything. We ate it all. And she said, well, my mother always makes the same amount of food every day. But she said today, for some reason, there was so much. She didn't make extra, but she said there was more than we could eat. And why don't you take it over to that white lady's house and put it on her table if she's, they didn't know I wasn't there. You know, why don't you take it to her? And we hadn't locked the kitchen door when we left. So she found it open and she just brought it in and put it on the table and we ate it. So 
you know, God has different ways, but it let me know he's able, he's able. Another time, uh, I remember going with the lady to, um, because I had a Chinese lady that once a week, uh, she had agreed to go with me in the Huampo area and knock on doors because she could speak Hokkien and she could speak Tiao Chu and she could speak Cantonese. I couldn't speak any of those. I could speak Mandarin, but I, I needed somebody to interpret the English, you know, or even the Mandarin, whatever it might be, all right? So she had said she would go with me. Now she was not a rich lady. She lived in the Huampo area. And this day she said to me, you know what? I don't know why God would tell me to give you money. In other words, you're a white person. You have far more money than I have. And why would he tell me to give you money? Well, I, I just said, did he tell you? She said, yes. I said, so are you going to obey him or are you not? All right, she said, and out came $5 and she put $5 in my hand. Once she put it in my hand and released it, I told her, sister, you don't know, but I don't have one cent of money in my pocket. I don't know what we were going to buy lunch with. I didn't have a cent. That's why he told you to give me this $5. $5 bought a lot in those days, you know. And I found through these things, it caused me to learn to trust in my God. All right. But when he starts blessing us, then we don't want to, because he says here, he taught me how to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. See, we have to learn it both ways. Some people, once they start to prosper, they forget God and they start going off and using those things for themselves. No, we have to learn whether we're prospering, whether we are being abased, all right? God alone needs to be glorified. So verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. No matter what the circumstances are, good or bad, I know that I can face it through Jesus and he can help me go through that situation the way he wants me to go through it, all right? Um, let's see here. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Number one is not just positive thinking, all right? To be able to face all circumstances in life, all right? Uh, we have to believe that God can change those circumstances or he can do what, it's not just positive thinking. We must believe with our heart, that, with faith that God, the God given kind of faith, where really our hope, our desires, our belief, our expectation is focused on Him. Let's look at John 15, 5 and 7. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. All right. Jesus said, I am the vine. All right. The vine has the life, the sap growing in it. When you take a branch that grows out of that vine and just break it off and it's, and it's you know, just left, disconnected to the vine, 
uh, it, it will eventually dry up, all right? Because the life is not in it, it draws its life from the vine. And so what we need to realize is Jesus alone is the vine who is full of grace, full of the life of God, all right? And of his grace have we received and grace for grace. We keep drawing that life and that need from him. We must stay in the vine. That's Jesus. We're merely the branch that draws its life from the vine. So that's why he says, he that abideth in him and allows me to abide in him. The same will bring forth much fruit. All right. If we don't abide in Jesus, we cannot bring forth the fruit of his life. All right. He says, without me, you can do nothing. I don't care if you have known him for 50 years. If you don't look to him and trust him to do it, we can do absolutely nothing. I don't care who you are, what we are, what we claim. If spiritually we're not staying in there through faith, believing in him, trusting in him, drawing from him, all right, we can do nothing, all right? We need to understand that, all right? If, verse seven says, you abide in me. And of course we know God is love. So that's how we know if we're abiding in him. You get angry with people and you want to hold on to that bitterness. You are not abiding in Christ. All right. And my words abide in you. That's obedience. All right. Then whatever you ask, doesn't matter what you want and desire. It shall be done. This is the secret to answered prayer, abiding in the vine and allowing his words to abide in us, not here, but through obedience in our life. As we walk a life of obedience, as we allow his love to flow out of us to others, as we do whatever he tells us to do. All right. Psalms 18 verse 2. Psalms 18, verse 2. <clears throat> the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Notice that the Lord is my everything, whatever it is that I need, my fortress, all right, uh, protector whether it's to deliver, I need deliverance, whether he's my God, he's the only one that can tell me what to do, all right, and that I need to obey and I need to, he's my strength. Uh, I'm going to read that again, and I'm going to emphasize my. The Lord is my rock. That's my foundation, my fortress, my deliverer. That means in every circumstance where I need any of these things, it's the Lord I turn to. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Because there are times he doesn't seem to answer. There are times he doesn't seem to be around. There are times he doesn't seem to hear us. Can I trust what his word says about him? Or am I going to start finding fault with him? Am I going to start doubting him? No, in whom I will trust. He's my buckler. That's my shield. The horn of my salvation. Horn here is not the horn of plenty. It's the horn that is um, the one that fights for me. All right. My aggressive power in my salvation against the enemy, it's the Lord. And he's my high tower, 
that means to let me know what the out there to see to understand spiritual understanding all right um let's look at romans 7 18 romans 7 verse 18 for i know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with with me but how to perform that which is good i find not yeah so you see you can you are able to say i'm willing but if you don't look to the lord to help you perform it you cannot perform no matter what it is you can say i'm willing and in the end you back out in the end you don't do it you know if you really are willing and god is telling you to do something he will provide as well you look to him as long as you're really willing so in my flesh that means in the natural just me in the body all right there's nothing good i don't care how long i've been to church i don't care how long i don't care what he's done through me in the past if i look at myself alone there's nothing good there everything that i need is only in the lord so i cannot look to the lord uh, myself I have to look to God. He is my everything. I have to totally be dependent on him. This has nothing to do with positive thinking. It has to do with putting what we claim into practice in those times when something comes up and we can't do it. We have to turn to him and cry out to him. Yeah, God worketh in you. Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Yeah. God can bring you to a place of being willing. Remember it said up in that last verse we just said, in me, uh, for to will is present in me, but how to perform it. Well, here it says both to will and to do. To will is the first half. If you're not willing, you'll never get to the second step. But just being willing, going up to an altar and praying or even saying a prayer at home, saying, okay, God, I'm willing. That's only half. Till you actually do it, saying you're willing is only half. All right. And it has to come first. And it's God that can bring us to that place to will. But then we need to keep praying, keep looking, keep believing until we're able to allow him to do in and through us what we're willing. All right. And let's look at John 17, 24 and 26. John 17, 24 and 26. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. All right. Now, before the foundation of the world means before there were any human beings ever created. Jesus, when he was here on earth, understood by the scripture that he had existed before now none of us have the right to look at anything that's talking about jesus and claim that's me no 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 there's only one jesus there's no two jesus we're members of his body we're bodily members he alone is the jesus the head the living son of God, and he has put us inside of him spiritually to draw from him his abilities, but none of us, and this is the problem, when we start being used of God, we start imagining it's me, I'm Jesus, no, I'm part of Jesus, I'm in Jesus, all right, and so it says here, G Jesus, when he's praying here on earth, he says, 
you know, those that you've given me, I want them with me where I am. He's talking about in the realm of the spirit, knowing who he was in God and knowing where he was in the very heart of God. He said, I want them to spiritually understand this and see my glory that you have given to me, not that they'll want to become that, but that they will see me in the glory you gave me. Verse 26. And I have declared unto them my, thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Yeah. Now, why does it say that the love that you love me may be in them and I in them. In other words, there's no way, even if that love comes into us, that we can share it unless Jesus is in us, enabling us to release that love out, all right? So um, I can do all things through Christ. Using number 10, all right, wow. Using this strength, this power, this ability, this life, you can put all those three words there using this strength. What do I dare to do? James 4, 7. James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. All right. But please notice here, before the answer is given us, uh, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But we need to see there's a first part to it. Before you resist the devil, make sure you have submitted yourself to God. Then that means you've bowed your will. You've given yourself totally to him. You want God's will and you have yielded to God's will in your life. Then you can turn around and resist the devil because you're one with him. Amen. And as one with Christ, we can turn around and resist. We can stand against the devil and say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. In Jesus' name, I command you to leave. And you, he has to go. He will flee from you. But we have to first submit to God, all right? Um, number two, then we resist, all right? Let, let's look there. First submit, yield your will to God. Surrender your desires and thoughts. Make sure your heart is right with God. All right. Um, that's submitting to God. Uh, again, I'm going to remind you of the story of that lady that um, she ended up. I, I didn't know it at the time, but we were in a missions convention and the missionaries were all told to stand by twos, husband, wife, husband, wife, unless they were not married. Then they stood alone as a single missionary and people in the congregation, if they had a prayer request or a prayer need came up and stood in front of these different missionaries who would pray over them. This lady came, she didn't stop in front of us. She, but she looked right at me, looked me right in the eye. I didn't know her. And her eyes spoke. Uh, I, I read it. it. It just said, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And I thought, whoa, lady, why do you hate me? I don't even know you. I haven't done anything to you. Why do you hate me? But it was the devil in her hating the Jesus in me. I found that out later. Later, I was asked to preach for the women, uh, and it was a big meeting, and there was a lot of, in this missions convention, it was just a women's meeting, and when I got up to preach, I'd barely started when I saw this vision in front of my eyes, this deep pit, uh, a, a pit, it was no water in it, but slime and mud, and a lady trying to climb out but the sides were slimy. So she kept sliding back down in there. And um, I, I told what I saw. 
And I said, I'm not going to deal with it now. If you're, if you recognize what I'm telling this vision, that that is you, then after the service, you come up to the, you know, in the prayer line, and then I'll, I'll deal with you at that time. And I went ahead and preached. Well, later, after praying for the people that came up, there was only one person left there. It was this lady that walked by me and her eyes said, I hate you. And so, you know, I asked her, so what, what is it with you? She said, you know, the devil is always coming into my bedroom. Now, I thought that was strange. He, he didn't come into the living room. He's always coming into my bedroom bedroom. And uh, I said, well, you know what the Bible says. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. He'll run. No, she said, that doesn't work. I've tried it. And all he does is laugh at me. What do you think I said? Do you think I said, oh my, you mean the scripture doesn't work? No, I didn't. I said, that means you haven't submitted to God. What is it in your life that is not right with God. And then she just burst out. I hate my husband. I hate my husband. Hello. She was married and she had children by this man and she hated her husband. I found out later she was going into lesbianism and she had a woman lover on the outside. No wonder she hated her husband. That spirit of lesbianism has a hatred for men. She had been with her husband how many years to have three children. And here she is saying, I hate my husband. I hate my husband. So, you know, she was not submitting to God. She was doing something in her life that was not glorifying to God. And she didn't want to leave it. She didn't want to give up her hatred for her husband. She wanted to keep this love that she had for a woman. All right. And then wondered why he laughed at her, mocked her with a hideous laugh when she told him to get out. And it wasn't the living room. It was the bedroom because it had to do with her love life and her who she was in Christ. When we marry, we become one flesh and one body and when we go off and want somebody else it's called adultery not just spiritual adultery but real natural adultery as well as the spiritual all right so um you know i prayed with her but she never repented and afterwards she ran off the 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 pastor told me that's when I found the full implications of it. I didn't know everything. I just knew you hate your husband. That, that's wrong, of course, you know. But later, no, she ran off, left her family, left her husband and chose this other. So you have to make sure your heart is right with God. Then only when you resist the devil. And we'll see that in 1 Peter 5, 9. Let, let's read that. 1 Peter Five nine. First Peter five, verse nine. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Yeah, there it's very clear. If you're going to resist the devil, you have to be steadfast in the faith. The way God wants us to live, we're 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 firm in that we're not deviating and doing our own thing instead of the way that God wants us to. All right. First John four, four. First John four, verse four. Ye are of God, little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know what this verse tells me? All right. We have overcome them because Jesus, the victorious one, lives in us. But if we're not having victory, it's because we're not drawing from him. We're trying to do it on our own, 
and it won't work. I don't care if he's been in you 25 years, if in your time of temptation and need, you don't turn to him and cry out to him and say, Lord, help me at this time. I need you. All right. And really mean it. It says we've already overcome them. We don't really need to do any fighting at all because Jesus who is in us is greater than anything in the world, any temptation, any situation, he's greater. But if you don't release your faith in him, if you don't recognize and cry out to it, and you just keep seeing it as you and that situation, you're not going to overcome. All right. Uh, 12, 11, we've already had that. So they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Make sure that we stay under the blood by the word of their testimony. Make sure we are giving him the glory, witnessing to what he's done, giving our personal testimony and the loving not their lives unto the death, all right? Um, verbally resist, knowing about it doesn't work. Actually doing it is what produces the results. I'm, I'm going to tell you, um, remember, greater is he than he that is in the world. The devil is the God of this world. And Jesus is greater than anything in the world but you've got to acknowledge it and by faith turn to him and throw yourself on him. All right. Um, I'm going to give you an illustration. There was a lady. In fact, I'm still uh, in touch with her. She um, wrote to me recently especially about when her husband had to go in the hospital and thing but she used to be in a light group when I was uh, my husband and I were um, the pastors of a church and she had a cramp in the knee it was in her leg but it was in the knee part it was terrible all right she couldn't walk all right um Okay, and so she asked for prayer that day in the life group. She said, Lord, I, I really, please, would somebody pray for me? I'm in such agony, you know, and I don't think she realized that uh, it was the devil, all right, putting this on her. And so um, she asked for prayer, and we all gathered around her, and we rebuked Satan. And we commanded him, take your hands off and be gone in the name of Jesus. And you know what? She heard and she felt a crack and suddenly it was gone. And I, I never heard her complain about that ever again. All right. She was set free because it was revealed. It was not a, a natural thing. It was a spiritual thing. And when we agreed together and commanded him to and verbally resisted him, he had to go. All right. So when it says resist the devil, whatever he's trying to do to you, uh, to assail you, assault you, tempt you, torture you, trap you, torment you, submit. Make sure everything is right in your heart with God. Then turn around and use the name of Jesus and rebuke him and resist him in the name of Jesus, giving the glory to God. Say, I cannot do it, but I have the name of Jesus and therefore I come against you. It will work. Amen. Question 11. What promise does Christ give to the over? Comer. Um, Revelation 21, 7 and 8. Let's read that. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. All right, let, let's stop. He that overcometh. It's the individual now. This is taken from the, 
uh, the book of Revelation, but it's not talking about any group of people, any certain church. It's talking about the individual believer, he that overcometh. That means to the very end, all right? Either to the end when the rapture takes place or to the end if we're going to go by way of death. We don't turn. We overcome. It says we will inherit. We shall inherit all things. And God's promise is I will be his God. And he shall be my son. All right. Um, okay. Let, let's read verse eight. Yes. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the oh. second death. Wow. So it's, notice that. You don't think the fearful, those that are always full of fear. You, you said, but I'm a Christian, but I have. Then you need deliverance. You need to go to somebody that knows God and knows who they are in God and, and just explain that. I, I, I just remember here I am a preacher and a and when I was in K Kota Kinabalu, all right, and um, I had that, it was a heart attack. I, no, it was a stroke, yeah. It was a stroke that I had. And anyways, I ended up going into the hospital, but I remember this terrible fear that just came over me. It was so strong and, and I was weak anyways, you know, that thank God that the doctor was a Christian doctor. And when he came in and I told him how this fear was just, had gripped me and it was just strangling me. All right. Oh, hallelujah. You know, he didn't say, I'll give you some medicine up. Boy, he just prayed and rebuked that thing and, and commanded it to take its hands off of me. And I felt it go. I've never had a spirit of fear that was as strong as that spirit. Of, and, and I was ready to succumb. And, but he, he just knew the rights in the Lord and in the name of Jesus set me free, set me free. Hallelujah. And I'm here to tell you, if you're trying to be a Christian, a, a child of God, but you're just full of fear, full of fear, you cannot exercise faith when fear is taking over. You've got to come against that. If you do it and it doesn't work, then find somebody can agree with you or two people to agree with you to rebuke and help you be free from fear because it says the fearful they're full of fear and unbelieving that's what causes the fear because you don't really believe when you're full of faith the fear has to go you can't have the two you, you can have the feeling of fear come but faith will rise up and get rid of it but when it takes over then faith just to the faith of jesus because the faith of jesus will cast out fear and then it talks about all these others we're, we're not part of the abominable murderers whoremongers sorcerers idolaters all liars all so i'm telling you 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 and i must not allow uh, no matter what it is to tell lies and, and to worm around because you, you do it once you can apologize and ask, God, but you continue to live a life like that where you tell the untruth. It shows you're not part of Jesus. He is the truth. All right. So um, under this answer of 11, I will be his God. And he will be my son. I want you to write there. So underneath Revelation 21, 7 and 8, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, starting with verse 16. 
second no, Corinthians? No, um, no, let, let, let's start with 14. Second Corinthians 13, verse 14. Second Corinthians ver chapter six. Chapter six. Verse yeah, 14. starting with verse 14. Read all the way down through to 18. And then, um, yeah, then second Corinthians seven, one. So that's from 14 to 18. And then, yeah, stop there. And then we'll pick up that other one. Okay. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what path, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God had said, said I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 18. Yes. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord, saith the Lord Almighty. All right. So this is talking about we're a separated people. All right. Come out from among them and be separated. Uh, we are, and this goes to marriage. This goes to business partnerships. It goes to anything where you have to be an equal. Now you say, what can I do when I got married? Um, I wasn't a believer, so I married a non-believer. That is a totally different thing. That means uh, when you get saved, you are the promise that God wants to also save your husband, or if you're a husband, that he wants to save your wife. But this is telling if we are already believers, don't go and get married to unbelievers. Don't do it. I don't care how good they are, how this they are, you can't join together with them, all right? And, and it explains it. Christ and the devil can't go arm in arm. They're not in agreement, all right? So it says we need to, and it says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? See, God's temple is a place to worship God. It, it and the temple of idols, that there's no, 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 no. Uh, you can't have anything to do with it. And our bodies are the temple of God. So we can't join with anything that is against God. We need to come out and be separate. Read 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Yes. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. All right, so this idea, you can be a Christian and live like the world and go on and use your body for immorality, or you can do things, you know, in business life where it's not above board, there's sneakiness, there's underhandedness, whatever it might be. All right, no, that, that you cannot. If having these promises, what are these promises? That he will be our God that he will recognize us, then we have to recognize him down here. By our life, we have to be the living um, living body of him. Uh, he has to shine through us, all right? And I, I remember there was this one man. He Yes, he got saved in, in the church, and he had accepted the Lord, but then he, he went away from God, but he never quit claiming and he still claimed to be a member of our church you know but he was living like the devil himself and when I met somebody they said so and so are they a member of your church I said no I said they left long ago well I was wondering because their life is a mess 
and they're claiming they believe in Jesus. They claim that your church is their church. No, 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 no. Uh, as, that's bad enough. But, you know, the problem is when we do that and we think we're okay, we're going to get left behind. And according to that verse that we have er, earlier, you know, we're going to go to the lake of fire. We're going to be with those that are abominable. They're liars. They're, whoa, no. We, we, if we're going to claim it, let's live it. All right. That means we need a holy life. And to have the holy life, we need to cleanse ourselves from not only the filthiness of the flesh, but also the spirit. There are things that are wrong in the spirit. All right. In the realm of the spirit, uh, that can go for jealousy, anger, hatred. That's of the spirit. All right. Only if you act it out, uh, then the body takes on. But you can have it and people don't even know about it. But it's wrong. It's wrong. Cleanse ourselves. All right. By getting under the blood, by renouncing it, by repenting of it before the Lord and perfecting holiness, all right? You, you don't do it overnight. It's a lifestyle that you become more and more like him in the fear of God. And this is the literal fear of God, which hates evil and loves that, which is of him and of himself. All right, so let's look here. First, Number one, under 11, heirs of God, he that overcometh, not a one-time thing. It's a continuous present tense. Each new challenge needs to be overcome, all right? He that overcometh, it's a continuous overcoming. At no time can you say, I am an overcomer, meaning at the very end. Up to this point, I'm an overcomer, amen. But I have to continue to be an overcomer to the very end. That's the one that inherits all things. A joint heir with Christ. Let's read that. Romans 8, 17 and 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. For if children then has as of God, and join us with Christ, if so be that we suffer the thing, that we may be also glorified together. Verse 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Right. Now these sufferings are not just uh, you're suffering pain. No, no, no. It's suffering for Christ. It's the suffering rejection, suffering shame, suffering humiliation, because you are a child of God living for God, all right? It's what he went through. It says, if we're children of God, then we are heirs. That means we're going to inherit everything from God, and we're joint heirs with Christ. We're going to be in that way, because we're in Christ. Whatever Christ gets, we get to share with him if we suffer with him. The suffering of his rejection, the suffering of his, uh, you know, from the devil through those that are non-believers and believers, all right, that are full of uh, their quote unquote, they call themselves believers, all right, religious, let's put it there, all right. It says the sufferings for Jesus of this present time, it can't be compared to the glory that is going to be revealed in us. So don't look at the circumstances. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Sharing with him, sharing in his sufferings, overcoming is during this time. Sharing in his glory and radiance sharing in his riches and wealth is next time inheriting all that Christ inherits. That's when we get to the other side. But here on this earth, it's a crown of suffering. 
over there is a crown of glory. All right, we learn that in Song of Solomon 12. Together with Paul, will you now believe that Christ's victory is for you? First, um, first Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, who's given us the glory through our Lord Jesus Christ. No, which giveth us the victory through our, our, are you reading from King James Old? Oh, yes, sorry. I repeat again, okay? But yes. thanks be to God, you given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. So are we going to believe that Christ's victory is for us? Yes, yes, yes. Thanks be to God. This, of course, is Paul speaking, but we can agree with God's word that came through the Apostle Paul. Let's all say this together, shall we? Thanks be to God, which giveth us, giveth, notice that. It's a continuous present. That's for each new situation, all right? Giveth us the victory, but it's through our Lord Jesus Christ, all right? It's up to date, on the spot for whatever need we have. Can we all say that together? Yes, I believe and I take his victory for myself right now. Amen. I'm going to pray for you. Don't go off, please, because when I finish praying, I have um, an announcement that I want to make. All right. Father, right now, as we bow our heads before you, may we not just learn these things with head knowledge, but oh Lord, may it go from the head into our spirit man. May our spirit man by faith lay hold of all these different verses that we have read and appropriate them for ourselves, especially when we face situations where they apply. May your Holy Spirit remind us to live as a child of God, to believe in you, to draw from your life of victory and allow you at our moment of temptation, our moment of trial, our moment of shame and humiliation to turn our eyes to you and draw from you that victory that we have need of. Oh, in the name of Jesus, Father, right now, may each and every person of the 500 over that are listening right now, I don't know what they're going through in their personal life, but I pray, Lord, that we abide under the blood, that we abide under the shadow of the Almighty, that we abide under your protection, and that we stay in Christ, in the realm of the Spirit, and Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be sitting on the throne of our life, directing us, leading us, guiding us, enabling us. Thank you, Lord. Father, if there are those who have joined the class who have not yet been baptized in the Spirit, as we said in our last class, using my daughter Debbie's illustration, the baptism of the Spirit is like having a card, a credit card. We all have the Spirit per se. He is with us, but he wants to be in us. And through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is like opening up that credit card and making it useful where we are able to draw on that card. If, if we don't, I've forgotten the word that we have to do. Uh, we have that card, but we need to make sure that it is 
signed over and the right things are done to, uh, to be able to start utilizing it in our life. And so it is, Lord. Yes, it took the Holy Spirit to bring us to Christ, to bring us into salvation. But you brought us into Christ. You died not only to bring us into Christ, but to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And that is received when we are baptized into the Holy Spirit and fire. He is activated in us. And then that work can start being accomplished in and through us. Lord, some of us like me, it took me a long time. I pray, Lord, that these will not take as long as I took to start seeing things after the Spirit. But may we, Lord, let it start working in our lives. The moment the Holy Spirit comes in us, that we might turn to you and draw from you and believe on you and trust in you in our daily walk of life that others might see you in and through us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, before I let you go, this is the end of uh, Lesson 10, Part 2, which just the question and answer part was written by a man in our organization, a missionary to China, in fact. All right. And then I have put all the extra things under the answers over the years. I've built this into my course. All right. And many, uh, many people have learned from this. But after finishing this lesson 10, part two, which means 20 different lessons we've gone through, I wrote some on my own, and we're going to continue. So don't not show up. Next Tuesday, show up, and we're going to start a lesson on idolatry, all right? Um, my daughter's church, and there are other some churches, they teach that right at the beginning. I, I rather go through the whole thing then when we begin to understand more of this uh, and people have really, uh, you know, if you're teaching it, especially to an unbeliever to go through the whole of idolatry when they don't even know Christ yet, uh, it's a bit heavy. So I prefer doing it. So we're going to start that. When that lesson is done, we will go into another lesson that I wrote that I feel God gave me the questions and the answers um, on witchcraft, which spiritual witchcraft and magic and things like that. Uh, we're going to go into all those verses and see what place it has and why we should not do certain things and so forth. And then uh, last but not least, I have written a lesson, though, in this uh, gateway to life. I don't remember if it was lessons five, lessons six. Uh, what do we do in church when we attend church? What are some of the things we do? One question, we take the Lord's Supper, all right? Um, that was just one question with an answer. So I take the Lord's Supper, which is communion, and I've made it into a whole lesson with uh, many questions and answers to make it more clear and also comparing it to eating um, food offered to idols. We will go into all of that. All right. So see you next week, Lord willing. God bless you. Bye bye.